Okay, guys, I feel like we've introduced ourselves a number of times. So I think I should stop doing that now, but that also feels weird. So I just can't do that. I'm Caitlin, co-founder of ATX, and we're back on day two of ATX TV from the couch with room 104. Thank you to HBO for continuing to give us the goods. I can't believe of all people though, we're not in Austin with Mark. But this is second best and we're thrilled to have Room 104 back because we premiered it at ATX when it began in season one. And we're here now in the final season at the first virtual ATX. If anyone can roll with the awkward nature of virtual, it'll be this group. So with that, I'm gonna intro your moderator, Steve Green from IndieWire. Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in to our panel today. Uh, before we dig into the show and what might be ahead in the show's final season, uh, let's introduce our panel. Uh, let's start with series co-creator Mark Duplass, uh, who's written and directed for Room 104 throughout its four seasons and has a wonderful shocked face. What's up, uh, guys? <laughs> Sydney Fleischman uh, has been an executive producer on the series since the start, and we'll be making her directorial debut on an episode this season. Uh, Hi. We have... Hi, Sydney. Uh, <laughs> we have two other panelists directing their first Room 104 episodes in season four. Uh, both of them have appeared in very different chapters of previous seasons on screen. Uh, Natalie Morales, who starred in the season two episode, A Nightmare. Hi, correction, oh. my second episode I've directed of Room 104. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, Karin Sony, uh, who is making his directorial debut and starred in the internet all the way back in season one. Uh, correction, this is my 500th episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, Mel Eslin returns to Room 104 in season four after writing and directing the fantastic season three finale of Specimen Collector. Hello. And Julian Wass, who's worn many Room 104 hats uh, in, season one, in season four. He is a composer and writer and director, just to name a few. Hello. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yes, thank you all for being here. Uh, really appreciate you all being a part of this. Uh, season four is very exciting. Um, and uh, all of you have contributed to the show in different ways. And I'm excited to talk about that. Um, so as a way into this, uh, I'm, I'm curious uh, for Mark and Sydney, you've been there since the beginning. Um, people playing multiple roles in the show uh, in front of and behind the camera. Uh, how much of that was part of the original design of the show, or was that kind of a happy accident that happened along the way? Yeah, I can sort of kick off on that because, you know, I've had this uh, show idea for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just when I came up with it like 10 years ago, they weren't making anthology shows back then. Um, and uh, luckily enough, I got to make two seasons of Togetherness with HBO. And they felt so guilty after they canceled this and let me make my weird ass night, nighttime Room 104 show. Um, and so, um, you know, when I started this off, I, I remember thinking like, this is a perfect opportunity for me to collaborate uh, in a new way. You know, it was a time when Jay and I were coming off of togetherness and starting to open up our circle of who we wanted to make stuff with. And I was starting to realize like, you know, if I start, making things with uh, younger filmmakers, newer people to the form, that not only will I be able to sort of offer a little bit of guidance, but selfishly, they're gonna prevent me from just repeating myself over and over and, and you know, getting what, what I call is the yips, you know, in, in the arts world, which is like, you, you see your favorite artists and filmmakers and musicians make great stuff for 10 years, and then it's either derivative, repetitive, or just bad. Um, so my idea was like, let, let me juice myself up with lots of new energy and voices. And the first stop on the shopping spree of that was with Sid Fleischman, who was my assistant at the time, which we kept hidden from everybody because we didn't want to, anybody to really know what it was. And, and, and I just said, listen, do we want to just do a crazy elliptical promotion? I knew she could handle it. I knew she could do it. Um, and, uh, and she said, yeah. So she essentially became my co-showrunner at that point. Yeah, and I think having having invited like inviting people back into the fold is just sort of what happens organically. Of we work with someone who we adore, like Natalie and Karen, and we just want to keep working with them. So it it I don't think we ever set out to be like, okay, we're gonna make these calculated choices. It's really who do we really gravitate towards, and who do we want to keep working with. 
That's great. That's great. Um, and and Natalie, now that you're returning to the show uh, to direct uh, for the second time, um, <laughs> uh, I, I how much does it help actually being a part of the sort of the on screen environment first to sort of have that entry point and know what it's like to be in front of the camera so that way when you're e even though you're you're covering different subject matter and it's a slightly different atmosphere and tone you at least are starting from that base and not starting from scratch yeah you know it's interesting um in general when to to direct after being an actor primarily i mean i start i i did direct a lot of theater starting out and a lot of sketch but on screen is a totally different thing specifically with room 104 um what was interesting is that season, I guess it was season two. Yeah, season two, I directed and then I acted in one later in the season. So I came back as an actor and like knew the crew and I, and it was like a very uh, fun and a, and a like backwards way to that I had from how I had done it before. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think this is an old saying, but all, all directors should take an acting class at least, um, just so that they know what they're asking people to do. And specifically, um, this show is, is so cool and such an amazing opportunity for filmmakers. And like Mark was saying, for, for younger filmmakers or for people who are just getting their start in the industry, because essentially what they're doing is giving you license to make your very own short on HBO. And it's so awesome because on any other TV show that's not necessarily an anthology, but even some anthologies have a, a similar look that they stick to, you know? Um, on this show, Mark and Sid basically hand you the reins and go, what do you want to do? And how do you want to make it? And how, and how, do, you, how do you see this? I mean, obviously with their guidance and support and, um, and, and producing skills, but also, it's yours. And so that's an opportunity that I don't think any show uh, has really offered <laughs> anyone, and especially not me. And so I, um, I'm so grateful for that, especially, um, you know, as, uh, as somebody starting out directing TV uh, for the first time, like this show got me into the DGA, which is so amazing. Um, so yeah. I, I wanna I wanna speak to to the Natalie uh, first directing episode because I remember um, I wrote an episode for my wife Katie Azelton to star in, and I was like, you know, who's gonna direct this? How are we gonna figure this thing out? What's gonna be the right person? And um, and I knew I knew Natalie. I knew you had the goods to do this, even though you were like lacking in like traditional director credits. Um, but I remember when you came back to me with your initial shot list and sort of visual plan for this. And I, I set this aside with Sid as a two day episode. We have two day episodes and three day episodes. And every now and then there's a four if it's massive. And we set this as a two, which means like, you only have so much time, it's dialogue heavy, it's only two actors. So like, kind of keep it simple. And Natalie had this like massive visual plan, <laughs> shots on sliders on how to do this. And Sid and I were trying to use our mentorship to gently be like, I know you want to do all this stuff, but you're really not going to be able to pull it off. And Natalie was like, I got this. I know what I'm doing. And we were like, well, all right. If you just want to hang yourself, fine. You know? <laughs> and she went in there and just fucking crushed it. And it was so great because she and Katie worked together. They got a lot of the performance kinks out of the way ahead of time. And just as all great things, as, as Sid and I were planning on being like her mentor through this with their first job we um you know we got our education in it too so it was really good partnership yeah by the way no pressure hey direct this episode i wrote for my wife yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but just in case it's hard you have two whole days to do yeah. it so. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, obviously the circumstances weren't quite the same, but Karen, you uh, stepped yeah. behind the camera uh, this season. Um, before we talk about uh, that episode and your experience, why don't we go ahead and watch a little clip from it first? Seth. Hi, hey, peace, how you doing? Fine. Okay, good. Good, that's good. That's good. So do you think, like, are, are you feeling ready? I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Ready for what? <laughs> that's not even a real 
still fucking laugh. <laughs> what, are you choking now? <laughs> oh, uh, oh, man. <laughs> what, what's so fucking funny? You, you are Sam. So, so, so Karin, uh, yeah. the, the episode that you starred in, uh, a, a lot of it was you. Uh, you were yes. your character was kind of the main focus, and and there weren't a lot of uh, sort of distracting things happening on set. A lot of the focus is on you, um, even though there's uh, not as much. Um, the the percentage of Jillian Bell in the episode that you directed isn't quite as much. There's mm -hmm. like she's still the anchor. She's still sort of the main focus. So, how much of your experience in performing? the episode that you did help sort of inform how you directed your episode? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, it was really, really helpful because I think for any actor, it is um, really scary. We shot ours over three days, uh, the one that I directed, the one I acted in was two days. Um, and it's just, uh, I think for a lot of actors who come on the show, the exciting and scary part is that it's a lot that you're being asked to do in a short amount of time. Um, normally there's a lot of sitting and waiting around on a set, but not on Room 104. And normally going through multiple genres and going on a huge arc within you know those two, three days. Um, and uh, she, I was able to answer sort of all those questions for her in a way that you know I hopefully was reassuring because I had been through it myself. Um, and she had seen that episode, so she had sort of seen that it was possible to do all that. And and for her, uh, you know, I don't want to speak too much for her, but it was something that she was a little bit nervous about, you know, putting herself out there in, in this kind of thing. And, and um, you know, when she saw the schedule and stuff, it, it, it was jarring at first, but, you know, I, I was able to be like, I've been through this and I think this is possible for us to do this without you feeling like, you know, you're jumping from one scene to like the end of the sh episode and not having enough preparation. Um, and then I just had to figure out how to, you know, make a believable hamster do stuff. Um, <laughs> really, really, really helpful. And, and me and her luckily had, you know, the actor part of the advantage was also that we had done two or maybe three movies at that point together. Um, and oh, wow. so, um, we sort of, you know, just knew each other in that way. And, and I just knew, like, you know, that how she likes to work on the set and how she likes to be directed kind of from just watching that. And so I think there was sort of a comfortable, like safe space, hopefully uh, with that too. And um, it just ended up being just the most fun to get to work with someone who as an actor, you only get to work with them in one way. If you're lucky, you get to be in a scene with them. Uh, in this way, you can really sort of, you know, experience their art in a way that's just so unique and different. And by the end of it, I just felt like I was like, I could propose to you because you gave me everything. <laughs> I just was like, I love you so much. Thank you. Um, um, and so it was just really cool. And I think it strengthened our friendship and it was great. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, uh, now, Mel uh, mentioned in your introduction that you also uh, wrote and directed uh, last season's finale uh, with Colby Smulders. If anyone watched the episode, the one with the, the forest in. Um, this one that you directed in this season is a little different. Uh, and to see just how different it is, uh, why don't we go ahead and watch a clip of that one? Dad's hogging the bathroom again. Mom, I need to finish my diorama. Okay, well, maybe your dad can help you with that today. No, I don't want Dad's help. He always ruins things. Oh, honey. Uh, Will, Maddie, who left this thing out again? <laughs> you guys, this doesn't work unless we all chip in. Okay? <laughs> this doesn't work because there's five people living in one hotel room. I said not today. Harry. Harry. Harry! What, 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 what? Jules needs to use the bathroom. That's what I'm doing, using it. So, so Mel, obviously uh, making uh, anything with sort of a sitcom environment is, is very, uh, very, very tense. And, and uh, there's, there's a tonal balance that it seems like uh, making that work, uh, you need to sort of get it just right. And, as someone who is both the writer and the director on the episode, I'm wondering like if that helped uh, the fact that you were able to sort of see this from start to finish rather than sort of coming on later in the process. Oh yeah, absolutely, definitely. And it, I mean, it does not hurt when you put Kevin Nealon on the set. I mean, there's <laughs> not much to do once he's on, it's just go. Um, so it, no, that was great. And I, you know, that, that was, you know, I did two this season and both of them were just like me being like, how can I take the four walls of the this room literally and figuratively and like 
push them and also fulfill my fantasies, which really my fantasy was to work on a multicam sitcom. And so <laughs> I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And, and uh, this might be a, a good time to sort of talk about um, sort of the writing process in the show. I know, uh, Mark and Sydney, you've talked about this before, but um, given that you're now in season four of this, I imagine there's a little bit of an evolution in how, uh, how you sort of decide like what stories ultimately become part of the season. And then once those sort of premises get decided, how the, the sort of the refining process works. Yeah, it's it's definitely undergone an evolution. I think at the in the beginning it was more of um, I had all these old existing ideas, um, kind of like when you look at a musician who makes their first record. They certainly have those first twelve songs, right? Um, but then once you do that, then you got to get some help. Um, and so as the seasons went along, we started to identify not only previous collaborators that we loved, like the people you're seeing here. Um, but uh, people got to know the show very well and got to reverse engineer ideas that could work inside of it. So um, what used to just be a room with me and, and Sid kind of ended up opening up to include Mel, who is the head of our company, you know? Um, and, that, and she started coming in early because she just knows us creatively so well. And, and, you know, just speaking candidly, Mel and I were also having these wonderful conversations about she works so hard and diligently overseeing all of our projects but she's got this deep creative soul to her as a as a creator herself and and i was just like please don't burn out and leave me like i need you and and like and she was just like you know yeah i'm, I'm good and i was like no 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 you're not really you're not um and so part of her coming on over 104 and writing and directing was her being able to express her pure self in a creative way that that she hadn't really gotten to do before which was so exciting for me to be a part of um and also, you know, keeps keeps the natives from getting restless and wanting to leave me. Um, and then, you know, likewise with with Karin, who you know, yes, he came on as an actor in the first episode. But Karin, you know, I met Karin when we did Safety Not Guaranteed together, which was, I think, your first job, like right out of. Oh, second, I was in an MTV TV movie called Worst Prom Ever. That right, so it yeah, was come your on, first Mark. project. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was an after production. So yeah. This was my first SAG production. Yeah. And um, and so when we brought him on to do what that episode that I wrote for him called The Internet, I knew Karin's ability to improvise. And when we say improvise, I don't just mean come up with good jokes. I mean. I wrote this script fast, Karen. I know you know how I write and I know it's flawed and I know you're really, really smart and you're gonna improvise this thing and make me look better and make the episode better. So he was already like writing and authoring that stuff. And that's very um, emblematic of the whole collaborative process. Like Room 104 is such, it has such an artsy craftsy vibe to it of like a bunch of 12 year olds running around being like, huh, that'd be cool. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. You know, it's like Beavis and Butthead art, like totally. Um, and so, you know, the, the room as uh, to your question kept evolving. And this year, Julian Wass joined our room because he's been a composer through the whole thing. We've always been leaning on him through the years to say, man, this episode didn't quite land as funny or as emotional or dramatic as we wanted. Can you push it? Can you help us with the score? And so he came to understand the show and, and we really built like a little, a little family that kind of organically happened. Yeah, uh, it's a perfect uh, transition. Uh, I would love to talk to Julian. Uh, you're obviously wearing a bunch of different hats in this particular season. Uh, and I imagine that it's not, it's not the case of where you can just focus one day on writing, one day on prepping for the episode that you directed, uh, and then one day on like music. Like it's something you kind of have to juggle all at once. Uh, may maybe I'm wrong, but uh, if, if that is the case where you're having to sort of uh, use all parts of your brain simultaneously, like how, how do you do that? Well, I mean, it was pretty separated out, I feel like, just especially because being in the room with Mark and, and Sid and Mel, uh, you know, we came up with all these ideas and talked about them. And, uh, you know, usually there's a bit of a, this season especially, we had so many original songs, which was really fun. So that was something that happened early and was really fun to work on. But yeah, absolutely. There came a point where there was stuff I had written that was, you know, being produced and I was prepping. So it does get a little bit hectic. But then by, then it was fun because then by the time uh, I got to score the whole season, I had this like really, really weird experience where I was like scoring an episode. And I was like, man, this moment doesn't work. Who wrote this? And I was like, it was me. It's my fault. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm, the one, I'm, I'm the one fixing my own problem right now. Uh, 
I feel like I stared into the void that day. <laughs> Amazing. I, and I, I think for for your contributions to the show, I think the um, the the opening theme, those those first few seconds where where it's kind of that that uh, atmospheric, you know, sort of flowing through the clouds moment. Um, it, for for the episodes of the season that keep that, and the ones that maybe put a little twist on it, it, it is it is kind of remarkable how that's been able to be a sort of a, a current throughout the whole show that even though you're juggling with all these sort of disparate stories and moods and tones like that, that opening, like for most of these is like works for all of them. And, and I, I guess, are you surprised that it's been sort of that durable over the seasons? Well, I don't know, Mark said, what do you call You guys each have a name for that sound. Meeps, bloops. I, I, I call them boops. Yeah. Boops. I call, them, I call them meeps because beeps. boops is kind of <laughs> sounds a little bit like poop and I just wanted to go the other way. But oh. well, are they I mean, different every episode? Is the intro totally different every episode? We don't have a different one for every episode, but of like, I feel like maybe a good 30% of the time we do a modification on it kind of yeah. based on what's to come. What's um, the key it's in, Julian? Is it in C? It's in B flat. You put it in B flat? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's that, yeah. Melodica. <laughs> there you go. Murder. Uh, Mark just needs to find a way to play music on every Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> you should say that. I was actually. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and uh, we do have one more uh, clip for this season. I think this might be a good time to show it um, because it is sort of tangentially related to something musical. Um, uh, let's uh, let's let's play that clip now. Oh, I'm so jealous. You're gonna hear this for the first time. I don't have a pick. I lost my pick. I can't play without a pick. Oh, you have picks? You always have picks on your hand. Yeah, I do. Can I change? Would you have back? No, I don't have this back. Back into the closet. What did you have back? You didn't tell us what we were going to do. Yeah, you always have back. Somebody did it. Here you go. Song's called Cradle Me. Mark, this uh, comes from your uh, first time being like really uh, starring in an episode of the show after writing and directing so many of them. Uh, aside from the uh, sort of long and stringy hair, uh, what what <laughs> did anything feel different about sort of being on set in that role versus sort of the other ones that you've been over this season? Yeah, there's been this uh, this plan throughout the whole show that I wouldn't plan to star in any episodes um, because we figured at some point somebody would drop out at the last second and I would have to step in. So we kept myself as sort of a pinch hitter. And then we got to the last season and we're just like, nobody dropped out, so we got to do something. And the origin of this episode was um, I got to be um, a little friendly with Mark Kozilek from the Red House Painters and Sun Kill Moon, he's a wonderful musician. Um, and I wanted to write a really dark episode for him about sort of an infamous singer songwriter who wrote an EP and then disappeared. Um, and he was like, that would be so cool. And then at the end of the, he decided he didn't really want to do it. So I kind of decided to just create it for myself. Um, and it was really a wonderful culmination of what I wanted this show to be, which was ultimately um, things that come from inside of me and strange parts inside of me, but are ultimately made better by the people I collaborate with and help me rise up. I, I really love vomiting out art very quickly. That's 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 flawed. And then uh, like I'm, I'm all about the you know Mel Mel and I talk about it all the time like the, the quick B minus. That's my superpower. It's like <laughs> I can make something quick that's a B minus, but I need my people to raise me up. And so this one was all hands on deck with Mel was there uh, every day making sure that my performance looked good and I was tracking story. Sid was there doing the same thing for me. Sean McAwee who is our DP I'm infamous for not having a very strong um, visual sense and vision. So I'm always looking at performance and story and just being like, Sean, just do something, make it look good. You know? <laughs> so it was really, it was so intensely collaborative from that point. I felt so safe, you know, um, just, 
doing this weird stuff and knowing that that they would catch me and i think in particular i have to really give it up to to sid who has been you know with me every step of the way and also there when either i couldn't be there because i was working on other things or or there were sometimes if i'm being honest i didn't i didn't want to be there i wanted to be able to like step out and and be with my kids because i have young kids at this time and sid is like the core of room 104 she is the thing that moved this thing forward we would not be here um without her which is why it was so awesome again to see her step out and like direct the season which i mean look she's been kind of ghost directing here and there anyway but like <laughs> to do it it was really it was really special that's fantastic and 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 that leads right into my next question about sort of uh sid now that you that, that you had the chance to sort of step behind the camera and, and and direct an episode um having seen sort of the arc of the the series and 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 seeing what into went into all these other episodes? Um, was there a particular uh, part about the directing process, or, or a particular um, idea, or, or something that you really wanted to add that that maybe you realized sort of hadn't been sort of done before on the show? I don't know. I mean, directing directing an episode on the show was a very sort of uh, consuming thing for me. It was very um, I, I don't know. It it really allowed me to see different things about the show that I hadn't seen before about what it means to be a director and what it means to work with actors. And I think sort of going back to what Mark was saying about the collaboration on set, it is such a, the the set that we created was just like full of trust. And I felt like I could step into this role that I was not totally equipped for, but I'd watched a lot of very talented, qualified people do. So to to have that support system to know that they would catch me if I if I needed to fall or lean or anything that I I think it was a really um I don't know it, it was a really eye-opening experience to be able to really acknowledge that and see the the space that we created for for creative people because it's a vulnerable I think directing and especially acting can be really vulnerable positions and to to see that from that perspective was really, it was really helpful as a producer and just any kind of creative person. That's great, that's great. I, I uh, having sort of seen the the show kind of evolve over these four seasons, um, for, for those of you who are on set for a lot of episodes and, and uh, for those of you who may just sort of as a viewer have seen uh, a bunch of them, um, you've put this, Room 104 set through a lot over the years <laughs> and and in a lot of different versions, a lot of different iterations. Yep. <laughs> uh, is, is, is there one that stands out as like, I can't believe we turned an ordinary looking motel room into this that, that stands out for you? Uh, is it phone I party, mean, Natalie? Is that yeah, what it is? I mean, for me at oh, least. It's yeah. phone party, uh, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. But, uh, know, we haven't man. shown a clip of that, so I don't know if a big if it's a big secret, but the title, Phone party, <laughs> <made> yeah. <away. laughs> yeah. uh, you might, you might be able to guess what 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 happens, but uh, well, yeah, I, I, we'll, that, we'll, we'll we'll save that reveal for. for yeah, yeah. Later, yeah. But, I will say uh, that motel room does not smell good when it's wet. Yeah. For, uh, <laughs> a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that may be the most abuse we put the room through. It was okay. it was a trooper. But but we've also been so irreverent in so many other ways. I mean, the other episode that Mel directed. Uh, is yeah. like you know uh, it's an animation episode we just like literally threw it away you know um and then uh there's other surprises this year i think we we're the most liberal with uh how we define the room this year I guess <laughs> natural by the time you're in uh in in season four but you know i think one of the most fun things that happened is one of the most creative uses of the set actually ends up in my opinion being uh our last episode um which kind of we planned on being the uh, last episode of the season, but will probably be the last episode of the series as a whole, you know, um, and, and, and thematically, uh, it also has some really wonderful elements to it that as we were realizing this was going to close it out, we were like serendipitously noticing how, how, um, from a metaphorical standpoint, it does close out the show, you know, in the right way. Um, and having said all of that, I will say that this is officially our last season until everybody comes and watches this show and, and brings in <laughs> huge numbers that we'll be back again for season five next year. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. You, you, you sort of alluded to like the, the, the order of a season and, and sort of how the episodes air. 
um, to, to use another sort of musical metaphor, it seems like track lists on an album. Like, like, like it, 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 mm -hmm. you, could, you could conceivably yeah. put it on shuffle, but, but like there does seem to be an arc and an order to how that gets put together. So how, how, how does that work on, on your end? I think a lot of it is about balance. I mean, it's, it's something that starts in the, in the early writing process of how do we make the season feel like it's of a, of a whole? Um, and it's the same thing with figuring out the order of like, okay, well, after this insane week, maybe we want something a little bit calmer. Or maybe this, this one was sort of a more creepy story. So we need something, some music to sort of counteract it. It's all about just finding, finding the right balance between episodes. It really is like a record. I remember, I remember mm -hmm. once we were talking like, you know, we knew what the first four or five episodes we wanted to make were, which you look at those kind of like the hits, you know, and then you start reverse engineering everything around it. And you're just like, ooh, you know, like a nice little mid-tempo cruiser between these two right here. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, time you can't. Time to break it down, time to get emotional. It's track three, let's do it. You can't eat a dick every episode. You just can't. It's true. You can't it. I mean, that's it, that's it. <laughs> I mean, or could you? Could you? I don't know. Uh, I, we, uh, we, we don't have too much more time left, but uh, I, as a way to sort of wrap this up and, and given that this, uh, this, this is sort of season four and, and, uh, and it may sort of be the last time we sort of see this show, um, for, for all of you, if you could uh, sum it up rather succinctly, uh, what kind of lessons will you take from your time on this show that you can, you can kind of apply to the, the work that you're going forward? <laughs> Hmm. Aside from you can't eat a dick every episode. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's the major lesson. That's, that's the main one. You stole mine, Natalie. Yeah. <laughs> what else is there? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say, since having been here since the, the beginning, um, you know, I would say that, um, you know, once I truly opened myself up to the fact that, um, I don't always know best <laughs> and let my ego go away. Um, all, all the stuff that I made started to get more exciting to me and more exciting to viewers. And I think that a lot of people don't talk about um, the longevity of being an artist and, and what is required to continue to make good art and to keep yourself sustainable and keep yourself fulfilled. You know, um, and we destroy ourselves a lot in this business to get where we think we want to go. And this this project has been the most sustaining uh, almost every project i do leaves me emptier uh, and i'm glad i did it but i'm but i'm empty you know and this one fills me up and it's been really special in that regard and i'm trying to comp that in other projects as i look forward i think for me uh the, the lesson i learned from this is is the lesson that i, I always learn from mark which is um, which is really good for uh, imposter syndrome, uh, for my personal imposter syndrome, which is that that like, what if there were no rules? Because you can't you can't be impersonating or be an imposter of something if if that thing doesn't exist. So what if you're just your own thing? And what if you come up with something new and do something different? And what if the box doesn't exist? Um, and I, I you know it's easy to go to get stuck in a, in a, in the way of thinking of like, well, this is the, this is the way this is done. Right. But I, I like being challenged and reminding myself that like, what if we make a new way to do it? You know, you know, as you were saying that now, that's something that. occurred to me, um, which is that, um, the dog in your background thought what you were saying was really poignant and the cat <laughs> thought you were full of shit. Like, it's so perfect. I mean, the that's cat. usually how it goes with them. That is how it goes, yeah. yeah oh my God. That's, really that's good. their general opinion of me. Yeah. I love it, yeah. Something that I always think about with this show that has been a big lesson for me, and I feel like Sid and I witness it a lot when we'd be in the room with the edits, um, was just, it's almost like when, when they say it's easier to write a novel than a short story you know, where it's like every, I mean, there is like such a like tiny little like space you have to craft a whole arc and you don't have another episode to continue the story on. So it is really like jam packing that full journey and really figuring out how to work together as a team to like make the most of every single second and choice, which I don't think a lot of shows really have, have to be put into that tight of a box mm -hmm. yeah, or room. The thing for me, oh, sorry, go ahead. Ah, me. Ah, uh, the thing, 
as as corny as it sounds, is uh, just to sort of believe in yourself. Uh, and I say that because the first season was one of the first times that I got to be sort of first on the call sheet, which was not an opportunity that I got a lot. And um, there was like, it was empowering to have that sort of opportunity given. And then in this season to direct, which was something that I always thought like, oh, that's none of my, not my business. Like, I don't think I should be doing that or whatever it is. But each time the show, it just has such a special place in my heart because it's, it's reminded me to be like, just you're your own worst enemy. Like, just trust that, you know, you can, you have something to say and you matter in that way. And, and so it's really special to me. You know? I, like I mean, I, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Say no, you, no, after you. <laughs> no, after you, I insist. Guys, stop fighting. <laughs> I was just saying how we all got along so well, you're blown. <laughs> we get along too well. Um, I think, I think for me, I mean, I obviously learned everything from the show going from, uh, having very little producing experience to, to doing what I, I got to do with the show. I think for me, the, the biggest thing that I learned was that storytelling is just about trust. It's all about trusting yourself. It's about trusting the people that you collaborate with and it, having that as sort of our, our baseline with this show, just freed us up to do all of the crazy things that we did. And that was such a cool and super rewarding thing. Julian, take us home. I'll tell okay. Well, I mean, one thing that, I mean, I, I became a writer on this show. So one thing that I've taken with me as I've written other things is like the privilege to write in different rooms or even outdoors in other places. <laughs> no, but um, <laughs> no, seriously though, like, but in, in all honesty, like when I started this show, I'd been composing for a long time. And if you had told me in season one that by the end I would have, you know, become a writer and, and director, I would have thought you were crazy. And I'm just like incredibly grateful to have worked on this show and to found to have found um, this other part of my creativity and for you know Mark and Sid and Mel to you know trust me and believe in me that way because um, it's uh, I really love it and I love the show so we love you yeah we love you <laughs> uh, you guys are all wonderful thank you so much for taking the time to talk about season four uh, which uh, I want to remind people uh, does premiere on HBO Friday July twenty fourth. Um, we will very much be looking forward to uh, the these episodes that we have left. Uh, thank you all for participating and uh, looking forward to seeing uh, what happens this upcoming season. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. I miss you all. Miss Same. You. Yeah. <laughs>